three. First Kings chapter three, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain something to you, and then I'll tell you why. You know, I preached from this scripture in this church at least once before. I'm going to read the same scripture tonight, but I'm going to preach on something I never have preached on before out of this scripture. And I, I, the reason I'm explaining that is because a lot of folks in our church have the habit of marking out in the margin of the Bible the text, and the date, and the preacher that preached it. And sometimes when I repeat myself, I've had some of you come up and say, January the 4th, 1968. So I just want to get to jump on you. That's why I'm explaining it to you. That I have preached from this scripture before, but uh, not what God has laid upon my heart tonight. I want to preach tonight on, I say mainly, on the subject of prayer. But I want to speak tonight on getting things because you pray, getting things you don't pray for, or getting more than you pray for as answers to prayer. And that you see that in the context of the scripture that I'm going to read. Now we're reading about Solomon, who was to be the third king of Israel, and is reputed uh, all down through the years as being the wisest man that ever lived. And um, it really doesn't have to do with our message. But I was just thinking of his wisdom. If you were to read sometime the last three verses of the fourth chapter of 1 Kings, you would read that Solomon was a wise man in five fields. He spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. So he was a great man in music, and you might say a great man in philosophy, for the word philosophy means a love of wise sayings, and he knew 3,000 of those wise sayings. So he was great in music, great in philosophy, and then he was great in the field of botany, for the Bible says he spake of trees from the cedar tree that's in Lebanon, even under the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. And then he was great in biology, for the Bible speaks of him speaking of beasts and fowl and creeping things and fishes. And then, he, of course, he was great in the matter of government, because that's what we're going to read about. He asked God to give him wisdom to rule the people of God. And the Lord answered his prayer. Let's read now, beginning in verse 5 of 1 Kings chapter 3. Please fasten your hearts and minds upon the word of God as we read tonight. And pray that the dear Lord will speak to your heart and mind out of the word of God. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he has walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. Now Solomon was forty years of age. He lived half of his life. But he felt so humble and in need before God. He said, I am but a little child, and I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And uh, may I just mention in passing, when we pray, 
This ought to be true of what we pray. We ought to be able to know that our speech or our prayer is pleasing unto God. This one was. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Now notice, there's emphasis on that. That Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and has not asked for thyself long life, neither has asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. See, Solomon said, I want to be able to judge between right and wrong. God was pleased with that and said, But you've asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, and I wish I had the time tonight, I don't have because it would be getting off of what uh, the Lord, I think, wants me to talk about. But I wish I had time tonight to just take that if right there and lift it out of this verse for a few minutes. God said, If thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I'll lengthen thy days. Now notice, God said, If thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes, I'll lengthen thy days. I'll give you long life. Now Solomon didn't enjoy a long life. Solomon lived to be 80. You say that's long life. Not in Solomon's day. There was nothing for men to live 150 years of age. And Solomon's father lived many years more than this. So Solomon did not live a long life. And I'll tell you why. And I want you to think of this tonight. All the promises of God are predicated upon a responsibility that God gives to you and I. You take any one of them you want to. You take Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You say that means I can get all I want from God and all I need from God. You can, but that promise is predicated on something. If you study that chapter five times, five times in that chapter, God, in His Word, said to the Philippians, to whom this promise was first directly given, five times you've done so and so. Paul said, you were the only one that supported the gospel that I preached. You were the first one, and so forth. Five times. Then Paul said, my God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What I'm saying is, the promises of God are always predicated on a human responsibility. Something God told us to do. Uh, for instance, you know, when, the, when Moses died and God put his mantle upon Joshua, God said to Joshua, two of the greatest things are going to happen uh, under, in your ministry. Two great things. He said, I'm going to give you the land. That's the land of Canaan. And God even described the boundaries of it again in Joshua 1. He said, I'm going to give you the land. You're going to have it. Seven nations in it, mightier than you. I'm going to give you the land. That's number one. Number two, he said, I'm, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I'm going to be with you, Joshua, just like I was with Moses. Oh my, what two great things these are. I'm going to give you all the land and they're going to turn it over to you and the children of Israel. He said to Joshua, you shall divide it among the tribes. And as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. You just think tonight how God was with Moses in miracles and signs and wonders and the greatest leader maybe that ever lived on the face of the earth 
other than Jesus Christ. And God said to Joshua, these two things I'm going to do for you. But now watch it. God said, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand and to the left. Then he said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now you hear me tonight. There are a lot of people that want to claim the promises of God and have the promises of God become a reality in your life. But they're all predicated upon you doing something that God has said in His Word you're supposed to do. Jesus said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. You say, well, I can just ask anything I want. God will do it. No. God put a human responsibility. you got to be sure you ask it in His name. Then He will do it. So I, I just can't get by this little if here in this verse tonight. If you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem. And I read a little statement the other day, by the way. I read a little statement, be careful what you dream. Because many of your dreams will come true. Be careful what you dream. This one came true. Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings, and offered peace offerings, and made a feast to all his servants. Now I want you to look with me for a few minutes tonight in verse 13. And I've also given thee that which thou hast not asked. I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked. So we're talking tonight not only about prayer, but getting more than you ask for. And getting some things when you pray that you do not ask for. Now I believe tonight, and I was thinking before I came down to this pulpit. I believe if I could go to the people sitting in this audience tonight. And go to you one by one as an individual. And ask you a question similar to what the Lord asked Solomon. He said, ask what I shall give thee. He said, Solomon, now if you, you just ask me. What you want and what you ask me, that's what I'm going to give to you. And suppose I would come to you tonight individually. And I know you people. And I know uh, many of you very well. And I believe if I were to come to the people in this audience tonight, one by one, one by one, and say to you, what would you rather have tonight? than anything else in the world. And suppose God were to say to you, you just ask me for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And I thought tonight, I believe this with all my heart. I think the people of this church would say to me, one after another, Pastor, what I want tonight, more than anything else in the world, is an answer to prayer. I believe, I know that would be true of me. I believe if God were to say to me, Tom, I'll give you anything you want. I'll give you millions of dollars. I'll give you anything you want. I believe I would say to God, there are some desires in my heart and my soul and some prayers on my lips that I want answered. And I think tonight I'm speaking for scores of people who would say the thing I want more than anything else in the world is to have my prayers answered. The longing, the deep burning desire of my heart, which I'm keeping before God, I want an answer more than I want anything else in the world. And you know, I want to say to you, friends, you know, when people pray, it's not just to say, well, now, if, I believe if I pray, this will be more apt to happen. Well, I believe if I pray, maybe this thing will come to pass. That's not what the Bible talks about in prayer. You see, the Bible teaches us that prayer will be answered when we pray 
and meet God's requirements. That's human responsibility I'm talking about. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, the psalmist said. You see, a prayer is a reality. Oh, I'll never forget a man that I heard preach many years ago, and some of you might have heard him. Dr. Henry Joel Hankins was a great, great preacher, uh, born raised down in Arkansas, and he became one of the great, great preachers of this country. And we had Dr. Henry Joel Hankins come here years ago when the big tabernacle was uh, down on Oakland Avenue. We had Dr. Henry Joel Hankins come here and preach in a citywide revival meeting. And I think 50 churches went together. Had Dr. Hankins, we did that every year, had some outstanding evangelist, evangelistic preacher. And I heard Dr. Henry Joel Hankins, great man of God. And um, I heard him tell about his brother Charlie being desperately ill. And I said to somebody the other day, I've never known as many of my personal acquaintances and friends and loved ones, I've never known as so many that right now need an answer to prayer because of illness. And many in our church that need, need to have God undertake for them. I know preachers tonight that need healing from the Lord and need God to answer the prayer. And I heard Dr. Uh, Henry Joe Hankins tell of his brother Charlie desperately ill in a little country home down in Arkansas. And so they sent for the doctor. Doctor came and the way the old fashioned doctors did, I think, put a, put a mirror before his mouth to see if he could get breath and he listened and he, he touched him, examined him, tried to get pulse, this, that and the other. And he said to Mr. Hankins, Mr. Hankins, there's not anything I can do for Charlie because Charlie is dead. And the doctor just reached down and took a hold of the cover that was on Charlie and pulled it up over his face and said, Charles is dead, Mr. Hankins, and I'm awfully sorry. I wish I could do more, but I can't, I can't do anything now. Charles is dead. But out there by the old-fashioned smokehouse was an old godly mother, Mrs. Hankins. She went out there. She had a place of prayer like Jesus did and like every Christian ought to have. She had a place of prayer, and she was out there behind the smokehouse where they kept the meat. Down on her knees, old-fashioned woman with a dress like clear down to the ground. She down on her knees praying. And um, the doctor just made that announcement in the house. She was praying for God to spare the life of her boy because he was uh, so desperately ill. And so the doctor said, Mr. Hankins, you, you might as well go tell your wife, tell Charlie's mother that Charlie's dead. And Henry Joe Hankins, the preacher I'm talking to you about, was just a boy, I think, 11 or 12 years of age. And um, his father said, Henry Joe, come on, go with me. We'll go tell your ma that Charlie's dead. He took little Henry Joe Hankins, 11 or 12 years of age, a country boy, and went through the little country home and out the kitchen across the back porch. And went out behind the smokehouse there she was, Miss Hankins, old country woman that believed that whatever God said was so, and believed that if God promised something, God was able to do it. And she was down on her knees, and she was praying, and calling out to God, raise up my son. And um, this, um, her husband, and uh, Charles, uh, Henry Joe Hankins came and said, Ma, Charlie's dead. And she just kept praying. And he went over and touched her. And he said, Ma, Charlie's dead. You just um, might well quit praying. Charlie's dead. And their hearts were broken. And Mr. Hankins and little Henry Joe were crying. That old country woman got up off of her, off of her knees. And she shook her long country dress. And she stomped one of her little feet. And she said, it ain't so. Charlie's not dead. They said, Ma, Ma, the doctor just left here and the doctor said, Charlie's dead. And he's in there in the bed and he's dead. She went uh, up over the steps of the back porch and went through the kitchen and went in the bedroom. And Henry Joe Hankins 
said he saw his mother reach and take a hold of the sheet that pulled, was pulled up over his face and rip it back off of his face and say, Charlie, you get out of that bed. And Charlie raised up in the bed. And she took him by the hand and she said, you get out of that bed. And she led him to his feet. I told that story one time. Somebody said, you really think he was dead? I don't know. I don't care. It, don't make a, it doesn't make a bit of difference in the world to me. I know the doctor thought he was, who know more about it than I do. But I know there was a God who listened to an old saint of God who believed in getting down on your knees and searching your heart and believing that God could answer prayer. I want to say to you tonight, God answers prayer. You know, a lot of people get tired of praying. And they, they give out a spirit of breath. A lot of people get discouraged in praying. I said to someone this week, God's not in as big a hurry as you are. God's not in as big a hurry as I am. God took six days to make the world. He could have made it in six seconds. And God's clock is never slow. Yours may be fast, but God will do what He wills, when He wills, but God answers prayer. Now, God said to Solomon, what do you want? Now, I want you to notice some things that happen inside of Solomon. And I'm, I'm tempted to get off of these good things because a lot of things about Solomon after this, they just went wrong in a hurry. But you know, Solomon did some things that God was pleased with. And God honored him. And God answered him. And God made him the wisest man that ever lived because he, that's what he, he asked God for wisdom to be used for the glory of God, not just for Solomon. You know, Solomon did this. I think, to put it this way, he put first things first. When God said to him, what do you want? Why, Solomon must have thought now, I don't want to be wrong about this. I don't want to be selfish about this. I don't want to be fleshly about this. I want whatever I answer to God. I want to be right. And he said, what is the thing that I need more than anything else in this world? What do I need? And he thought to himself, why, I've been made king. I'm 40 years old. My father, David, is dead and gone. And I have been anointed king. And here's a multitude of people whom the Bible says no man could number. How can I rule these people without understanding between good and bad, is what the Bible says. And he asked God he, for the thing that was primary and the thing that was first. And you know, a Christian ought to put first things first in their life if you expect God to hear your prayers. I, I guess I shouldn't be negative, but I am negative. Uh, the only thing positive about me is that I'm positively negative sometimes in my preaching. And that's, I'm positive about that. So I was thinking tonight, um, a lot of folks are, are not here. Why, you know the Christians tonight uh, who belong to churches all over our city, and of course, some of our folks are other places. They're where they ought to be. But there are a lot of folks ought to be right in this house of God tonight. And you know, an awful thing has happened in America. I mean, I mean it's an awful thing. I know I've heard people say, well, get out the gospel every way you can. I believe that. But do you know that re religious television programs have nearly ruined the churches of America? And I'm not just talking about the bad ones and a lot of them not worth it. Not worth the turn of the dial to hear them. I'm talking about even the good ones have been harmful in that a lot of Christians have said, Why, why bother? Why get in my car and drive and go? Why go to a church? I can have church in my home. I'll tell you why. God didn't, God didn't teach it that way. God said, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And I, there are a lot of Christians that don't put, who do not put first things first. And I believe that a principle in a Christian's life is that they ought to put first things 
first. And a many a Christian tonight is living in secondary matters when God wants us to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm not surprised that God answered Solomon's prayer because he put first things first. He did something else. He sought what he thought God wanted. You know, a lot of times when we pray, we, we pray for something and we try to we try to maneuver God. Now listen, God can be influenced. God, You can move God's arm in prayer. But I believe that when we pray, we ought to seek what we think God wants. Oh, I, I can never, never get off my mind when I think, think along this line. I never get off my mind, our Lord Jesus. You know, in the bloody garden of Gethsemane, I've been reading it recently in my private devotions in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Lord in the garden. You know, Jesus never deviated from the cross. When he's 12 years old, he said to his, his, um, his virgin mother and to Joseph, his foster father, he said, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And uh, he said on another occasion, for this cause came I into the world. That is to die. Jesus Christ never one time ever deviated from the cross. The Bible says his face was set like a flint to go to Jerusalem. That is, he, he had his whole face and heart and soul set on going to Calvary for you and for me. The Son of God would never violate the Holy Scriptures. And the scripture said he would come to die for the sins of the world. But in the garden that night, oh, what he suffered before he ever went to the cross. You talk about suffering. Have you ever known anybody to suffer so inwardly? There, you know, there's physical pain and there's an emotional pain and there's a spiritual suffering. And in the garden, have you ever known anybody to suffer until the blood in their veins found its way to the pores in their skin. And think of what it was like that night. Blood oozing from the flesh of Jesus as he knelt beneath the olive trees in Gethsemane and prayed in agony until the blood came from the very pores of his skin. Bible says in being in agony of soul. But this is what that touches me. Three times, you know, he left, um, he left um, uh, eight disciples at the edge of the garden of Gethsemane, took Peter, James, and John a little deeper. Judas is gone. That accounts for the eleven. Then he went a little farther. That's just like Jesus. And he went and he, he got down alone and he prayed and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And I say, Jesus, what cup are you talking about? And there's only one answer. This spotless, perfect, sinless, holy Son of God, who never sinned and hated sin, but loved sinners. He knew that tomorrow, hanging on that cross, there would be unloaded upon him the sins of the world. Mine. Yours. And oh, you think about Jesus thinking about sin on his soul. And he said, Father, if it be possible, but here's what I like. Three times he prayed the same prayer. Three times he said the same thing. He ended it. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, the hardest thing in the world to do is to yield to the will of God for your life. That's the hardest thing to do. Because I don't know why, but God is, is so fixed it that when you're confronted with his will, it doesn't look easy and you can't see the end from the beginning. And the hardest thing that a Christian has to do is just step over into God's will and say, live or die, sink or swim. 
This is where I want to live my life, in the will of God. Now, Solomon sought what he thought God wanted, not his will, God's will. He sought what was for the best interest of God's work. You know, folks, when you're asking God for something, you ought to think about, now what is this going to mean to everyone? Solomon thought of that. He thought of these millions, these millions of people. And when he prayed, he sought what was for the best interest of the work of God. And I want to say something to you tonight. I believe that Solomon, well, at this time, was more careful about what he was than he was about what he could have. And I believe as a Christian tonight, you ought to give a lot more thought to what you are than you ever think of giving to what you can have. If you give thought to what you are and be what God wants you to be, you can have everything God ever wants you to have. But if you're not what God what wants you to be, you won't get it. A Christian ought to, ought to be more careful about what you are than what you have. You know, Jesus said, Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And Jesus said that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Now, listen. This is where people tune you out. They tune you out when you talk like this. But I want to tell you, you better be giving more thought to what you are then you give to what you can have. Amen. And that's what Solomon's doing. He said, I want something from God. I want this prayer answered. God answered it. I wish I had time to give you an illustration. I think of Gehazi that traveled, Gehazi that traveled with uh, one of the greatest men of God that you find on the page of the Bible, Elisha. Traveled with him for years and years and saw all, all his miracles. And Elisha wrought more miracles than any other man in the Bible other than Jesus Christ. And one day a rich man came, a general of the Syrian army, by the Naaman by name. And he was gloriously healed and saved. And he went back into Syria, a child of God. And he said to Elisha, uh, let me give you something. You know, that's... That's just human nature. People want to give God something to get saved. But here's a man said, I'm saved now, and I want to give something. And Elisha refused it. You know why? Even though he's in the Old Testament, Elisha would not violate the doctrine of free grace. He said, I won't accept anything from this man. If I do, somewhere along the line, the devil will say to him, you see, you paid for it. And I'll tell you, friend, you don't pay for salvation. Amen. Not one second of it. And uh, old Gehazi standing off saw all this. And this man, Naaman, was a leper. And he'd just been cleansed and saved and gloriously. God had worked in his life. And this man, Gehazi, saw all of this. And so after Naaman and his retinue of chariots and, and wagons and uh, servants and all had gone, he took off after him. And stopped him, and, and uh, Naaman recognized Gehazi as being a minister or ser servant of Elisha. And he said, um, has something happened? What, 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 what's, what's going on? And um, Gehazi said, my master, after you left, had some people come to visit, and he has no bread to set before them, and we need so many changes of raiment, so many shekels of silver, and so, and, and so forth in order to get all this. And Gehazi thought more of what he could have than he did of what he could be and what he was. And when he got back, Elisha said to him, the, the leprosy of Naaman be on thee. And let me say something to you. If you have leprosy, what does a few shekels mean? Nothing. I repeat to you, we ought to give more thought to what we are than we give to what we can have. Now, Solomon prayed for wisdom, and God said, I'm giving you some things that you've not asked for. He gave him riches. Now, God said, you didn't ask for riches for thyself. Note that in the Bible. He 
could have asked for riches, and God could have given it to him, and everything been wonderful, if he'd asked for the right reason. He said, Thou hast not asked for riches for thyself. A man said to me, I love to make money because I love to give. And I said in my heart, and God loves you, brother, because that's the way it ought to be. And uh, as God said, I not only give you wisdom, and listen, you can have that. You know, I just, I just get so happy when I think about James 1, 5. If any, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not, shall be given him. Do you know I can know anything I won't need to know? Now, I can't know everything I'd like to know. I'd like to know where, what some of these sorry rascals are doing right now that ought to be here in church. I'd like to know what they're doing right now. I got feeling that way one Sunday morning years ago and there's a board member wasn't here and he hadn't been coming. So I, went, I just went off the platform went and called him. Said, hello. Called his name. His name wasn't John, but we call him John. Hello, John. Why, this is Brother Tom. Silence. I said, a mission church. He said, yeah. He said, my daddy came and we've been going fishing every Sunday. Your phone may ring sometime on some Sunday morning when you're least expecting it, so you be here. But here, he didn't ask for, for something to use upon himself. He asked for wisdom. God said, I've given you riches. And God will give you wisdom. A lot of people say to me, what shall I do? And I say that lots of times. But then I go to the Bible and God said, if any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God. God can show you. God can give you wisdom. Remember that tonight. Because there's a many a person tonight needs wisdom from God. What shall I do about this this circumstance, this problem, this need. What shall I do? Which direction shall I go? God can show you that. That's what the Bible says. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth like a wave of the sea, driven the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he should get anything of the Lord. For a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. But you ask God, believe it. God will give you wisdom. But God gave him riches and honor. And um, I like 1 Samuel 2.30. God's word says, Them that honor me, I will honor. You honor God. All right, now, I'm, I'm to my text and my time's up and I'm going to close in about two minutes. promise you. But the text says, And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked. You know, a lot of people in this, in this church tonight, I know a praying people. I know that. And I know many of you have had answers to prayer. But do you know this is always true in a Christian's life. I have given, also given thee that which thou hast not asked. Why, we have a prayer life. We pray. But we never have asked God for sickness. Anybody ever prayed, oh God, make me sick? I never have. I prayed for God to make me well. God says, I've also given thee that which thou hast not asked. I've never asked God for enemies, but I want to tell you, every Christian that stands for something and is something and believes the word of God and believes in soul winning and believes in separation is going to have some enemies in this world. You say, well, Brother Tom, I think if you just love everybody and be sweet, oh, pfft. don't give me that stuff. The sweeter you are, the more apt you are to have some enemies. I think you ought to be patient, merciful, kind, forgiving, loving, tender, all of that. You will have some enemies. If you don't have any tonight, if you don't have somebody that's against you tonight, you must not be standing for much. Why well, think of Jesus? Judas, one of his own preachers, became his enemy. Well, whoever asked God for enemies, I never have. But I've had them. I don't worry about them. I never worry about enemies. Doesn't bother me the least bit in the world. Never worry about them. I don't believe anybody can ever harm me. I don't think anybody could ever destroy, destroy Tom Malone, but Tom Malone. I don't think there's a person out here that could destroy me, but I could. 
So what's he used to worry about enemies? Everybody had them. Jesus had them. You'll have them. Nobody ever prayed for enemies. Yet anybody here tonight ever prayed, now Lord, help me to lose some of my sweetest friends. No. You've had a prayer life, but sometimes God has put some things in your prayer life you never even asked for. Oh, to lose a friend. And, and sometimes, you know, when you lose a friend, it's usually somebody you've done the most for. I think of old Dr. J. Frank Norris. Years ago, somebody said, Dr. Norris, uh, Reverend so-and-so sure talking about you. And he put his hand up and started scratching his head. And he said, well, I don't ever remember doing him any favors. That's the way it usually is. You, you're going to have that in life. You're going to have, you're going to lose some friends in your lifetime for whom you've done the most. And it hurts. But you've got to commit it to God. The Lord said, I've given thee that which thou hast not asked for. Whoever asked for loss of friends, whoever asked for unexpected events, why well, you get up and you're praising the Lord and all of a sudden something happens. You know, didn't the last thing in the world you wanted. You, you don't have to pray for the death of a loved one. That's going to happen, does happen. Whoever prayed for a fierce attack to the devil, but it happens. God said, I've also given thee that which thou hast not asked. Now here it was a positive thing. I've given you both riches and honor. And I'll give you long life if you live right. But you know, God brings into the life of those who pray some things we don't ask for, but God knows exactly what we need. I don't refer to this for any, any, any reason except to use it as illustration. But about 39 years ago, I went down to Texas and preached in the First Baptist Church of Fort Worth, Texas, a good many times. And the pastor of that church was in his last days on this earth. And one Sunday night while I was preaching, the, the pastor had asked me if I would ever come to the First Baptist Church of Fort Worth, Texas. And I said, I don't know. The Lord would have to lead me and give me the answer. And one Sunday night while I was preaching and Mrs. Malone and our two oldest children were there, that church, they had 3,000 in Sunday school. Their total indebtedness on the whole face of the earth was $5,000. And had 3,000 in Sunday school that day. And that night, the church stood to their feet and gave me a 100% vote and call to come to that church. And at that time, we were worshiping in a little beer tavern and about the same time had put up a Quonset hut. And I want to tell you, it looked like a hut. And I thought of all oh, my this great church and this great opportunity. But I thought, no, I better ask God. I better know what God wants for me. And I labored in my soul. And uh, the, the, that church would call Ms. Malone every day, every day, every day and say, uh, as he made up his mind, is it coming? She'd say, I don't know. He'll do what God says. And I was praying, praying. I said, oh, Lord, don't let me go wrong. Don't let me make a mistake. Don't let something that's bigger than what I have attract me and draw me off. And I prayed, and it's no, it's no credit to me, but God, God closed the door. God said, no, you're not to go. And I thought of that this morning when I heard Fred Schindler preach. If I had gone... There had never been a Midwestern Baptist College. And God wanted a school over there where people could be trained and go out as missionaries and preachers. And I looked out there this morning and saw Wilfred Robinson, who was an alcoholic. The people of this church later called on him and he was saved. And then God gave this church such great palmy days. You folks, most of you know nothing about it. We've seen these these altars fill. We have baptized 200 people in one day. And I've so often thought, and you know what happened? That church went down. And, uh, and great trouble. But I'm so glad God 
gave me what I needed. And God kept me where he wanted me for the moment. God said, I have given thee that which thou hast not asked. And listen, folks, when you pray, God will answer your prayer. But God will know what else to include with it. Let us pray. Father in heaven, bless thy precious word to our heart tonight. Lord, we weren't just preaching a few minutes ago and we said that an answer to prayer is probably what everybody in this house wants more than anything else in this world. Lord, you've been so good. You've answered prayers. You've answered enough to keep us so that we'll always know that you answer prayer. And you haven't answered enough so you keep us praying and trusting and looking to thee and believing. We love you tonight. I pray you'll bless the hearts of these dear people. Teach us something about praying, getting things from God, and about doing thy will, and being what you want us to be, no matter what it costs. For Jesus' sake, with our heads bowed and eyes closed.